have a few people attending today who indicated that they are new to the FDP program. The FDP Institute provides world-class training and education to financial professionals to meet the accelerating needs of digital transformation in the industry. The Financial Data Professional Institute was established by Kaya Association to address the growing need in finance for a workforce that has the skills to perform in a digitized world, where an increasing number of decisions will be data and analytic driven. The FDP credential is the first of its kind in the industry and reflects expertise in data science and its practical applications in finance. To earn the FDP designation, candidates have to complete either Python or R classes. These can be completed either before or after the exam. The comprehensive exam contains 80 multiple choice questions and two to four constructed response questions. There are no programming questions on the FDP exam. Similar to the CAIA and CFA exams, the FDP exam is built around nine topics that are reflected here on the screen. The study guide provides a roadmap to target your study hours. And just like the CAIA exam, we offer two test options for, your exam, for our exam, either in a test center or through remote proctoring. Registration for the October exam opened on May 25th with early exam enrollment. But now on to today's event. I'd like to introduce you now to Keith Black, Managing Director, Program Director, and an FDP Charter Holder. Welcome, Keith. Uh, thank you and, and welcome everyone. It's, it's great to be here today. Uh, to talk about uh, deep reinforcement learning for asset allocation in U.S. equities. Uh, today, we're joined by Miguel Nogueira Alonso, uh, who's founder of the Artificial Intelligence in Finance Institute. And he's going to share with us uh, his findings on deep reinforcement learning and importantly, contrasting deep reinforcement with uh, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Uh, go ahead, Miguel. I, okay, hello, hello everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, to uh, what we're going to talk about is uh, today is uh, um, something we we wrote uh, with um, uh, Sonam Shribastava, uh, and 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 I'm going to talk about reinforcement learning in U.S. Equity. And as Keith Black uh, was mentioning, so uh, I'm going to some sort of be discuss um, how reinforcement learning algorithms um, can help uh, on different uh, on different finance finance tasks, but at the same time the challenges uh, and the limitations uh, of these models. Um, so um, as, as Keith was, was saying, I'm, I'm, I'm in the board of the FDP, I, but also uh, I, we founded the, uh, in 2018, the Artificial Intelligence Finance Institute uh, and our, our mission is uh, to provide uh, financial education on the, in the domain of uh, artificial intelligence machine learning algorithms uh, in finance. And in order to do that, we have uh, some of the most brilliant uh, professors uh, in New York and globally, and uh, we offer um, boot camps, and and we also do a lot of uh, research, right? Uh, the quick uh, thing about myself: I have 25 years experience in asset management and banking, right? I'm the founder of the AIFI Institute. I'm also head of development of of, of global AI. I'm also on the board of. Uh, FDP and uh, uh, an excellent uh, certification qualification program, and I've been working um, uh, again in the financial industry for uh, 20 years, 10 years in, in UBS, uh, 10 years in uh, Anbank, an European bank. I'm also professor at, at NYU Quran, in which I, 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 I teach uh, financial mathematics. Uh, I taught the first course in the United States of Big Data and Finance at Columbia. Uh, I taught at Columbia University for seven years. And I, again, I'm now at NYU Quran and I have an, uh, uh, an, 
<clears throat> as a PhD in quantitative finance and the, uh, that I got in 2010. So it's, uh, and we, I think um, um, this is a very exciting time. And, and uh, I think this is a very exciting time, not, not, not because markets keep us really uh, very busy, which is obviously uh, uh, something uh, important this year, but, but also because uh, we're, uh, as we speak, researching uh, and looking at uh, new tools uh, in the financial domain. Right. So, in 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 order to uh, in order to uh, some sort of big to give a, a little bit of a context of uh, why uh, or, or how uh, these algorithms uh, are being used and can be useful uh, in financial applications. Right. We uh, I think that all of us have taken courses or or or, or we're giving courses on asset allocation and and modern portfolio theory. Right, uh, risk parity and different portfolio allocation approaches. Uh, then, uh, obviously, factor models, right, in which the bulk of them are, are linear factor models, from French models, para models, uh, uh, PCA models, and then, um, and obviously, option pricing and and delta hedging and so on. So, finance has a lot of different problems uh, that can be solved. Uh, using mathematical models. And uh, we actually started in 2017, more or less 16, 17, um, when basically all the industries and in, in even science started to move to, okay, let's, let's, um, let's start to use uh, some sort of uh, machine learning models, right? And, um, and we've done a lot of work uh, trying to merge uh, those some sort of traditional models, which is basically low dimensional models, uh, except in portfolio allocation, the rest of finance was low, low dimensional finance, so to speak. And, um, and big data and machine learning has, we think has been a great addition, right? And obviously FTPI is also there because uh, that brings new education needs, right? And, and IAFI too, right? So we all know we have um, that machine learning or, or, or basically in mathematical modeling tools of complex systems, we have uh, some sort of three, in more, three important fields. Right? One is supervised learning and supervised and reinforcement learning. Today, we're gonna to be covering, um, we're gonna be talking about reinforcement learning, but just a quick, a quick recap on what do we mean by supervised learning. We're trying to predict or describe. We're doing regressions of classifications. The idea of doing regressions is we go from a system of, of R, uh, of N dimensions, Rn, right? Uh, for example, 500 stocks and, and for example, 200 features or factors, right? And R might be, for example, returns, right? Um, and this is, uh, I would say, the most important problem uh, that we had, we still have, right? And in order to do that, we begin given inputs and outputs. So we have X's and Y's, we pick a training set, uh, we also pick a test set, we try to, to, to train our algorithms on the training set, we evaluate them on the test set. The same way we did, we, we were saying in finance, this is back testing, uh, and this is out of sample, right? Um, so the main idea is that we need to, ev to evaluate how our algorithms uh, might be working in real life, which is, a, which is really hard, as we all know, in finance. In finance, uh, it's one of the domains in which, um, in which regressions, nonlinear regressions or so, are harder, right? Um, just because of the high dimensionality of the problem, the potential non-stationarity of the problem, uh, and so on and so forth. We also have a bunch of classification problems. So for example, we might be interested into classifying states, right? For example, high volatility, medium volatility, low volatility, or outperforming stock and the performing stock. So classification problems, right? The idea here is that we wanna go from RN to K classes, right? And uh, as well as we did for regression, we're gonna pick a data set in which we have examples, potentially as many examples as possible, and then we're going to try to to make our algorithms learn potentially potentially 
linear or non-linear classification problems, right? Um, maybe the most important, the most important uh, qualitative aspects on why we are you on why machine learning models might be useful in finance um, is obviously because machine learning models have proven to be successful in very high dimensions, right? And certainly finance, as I said, for example, in the portfolio allocation domain, uh, we have really high dimensions. Um, when we have non-linearities, so, so we, we, we obviously can, cannot guarantee, right, uh, that, for example, um, let's say that the traditional models in finance tell us, okay, you have to build a linear factor model, right? A Fama French model, right? A Barra model, uh, and Ross model, so on and so forth, right? But why uh, there's a the, why there's a linear relationship between factors and returns, right? So a nonlinear model might help us, right? Um, okay. Then there's a second field which is unsupervised learning, right? And unsupervised learning here, what we do is something really surprising. Here we're only trying to model the X, capital X. What's capital X? It's a matrix. It's a data set. Right, it's a data set of, for example, stocks and factors, right? But we don't have like X's, C's, or Y's, right? So here we want to explain, right, um, how X, um, and and we have several ways to do that, right? Obviously, one is matri matrix factorization techniques. So you can do a single value decomposition. You can do uh, P PCA, principal component analysis. Um, so again, one matrix factorization um, algorithms, and then we, we have clustering techniques in which we, we, we want to learn class functions, right? And um, there's also uh, an emerging, so to speak, family of algorithms that's been more and more used, which is uh, generative models, which is we're trying to model P of X, right? Uh, so the density modeling of, of X, instead of the supervised learning in which we're trying to model P of uh, Y given X, right? So conditional pro a conditional model, right, of, of Y given the axis, so given the, the, the features, so to speak. But, but another supervised learning problem, we just don't have these axes, uh, these Y, sorry. So we have axes. Okay, so the idea is uh, a generative model uh, can can the generative model be able to discover how this right uh, system is evolving or how this X? And then uh, the, uh, the 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 topic of today is uh, reinforcement learning, right? So um, and what is reinforcement learning? Reinforcement learning is we have um, uh, the the states we have uh, the states of the world which which uh, the model have to define. We have the actions, right? and the actions, the sequence of actions is what we call a policy. And the policy, if we want to find an optimal policy, which is a policy that maximizes the reward uh, given the states, right? This is prescriptive. And obviously, this is a family of very useful models or potentially very useful models in finance because finance is full of intertemporal choice problems, right? Um, for example, portfolio allocation is an temporal choice problem, delta etching, right? We have a portfolio uh, of call options or exotic options or put options, and, and we have to some sort of, uh, we're working for a large US institution, and, and we want to some sort of figure out how can we hedge that, right? And, and so we need to some sort of, um, uh, again, define a delta etching model, okay? So reinforcement learning can help in, uh, in all these problems. And we'll see, we'll see uh, today uh, how, right, in, 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 the, in, the, in our short presentation. And then um, I, Igor Halperin has, has, has promoted this uh, inverse reinforcement learning models, which is basically, uh, we have to learn the reward function. Okay, so let's move on because uh, here we have in these slides, in this slide, some of the user cases, right? So I'm gonna skip the here the details. The the, the main idea that what we're gonna see in the in the in the in the paper we wrote is um, is um, how can we uh, some sort of define 
uh, or how can we find an optimal uh, portfolio allocation using a reinforcement learning model, right? Um, okay, which is again an intertemporal choice problem. Okay. Um, notice that we've set deep, right? So it's because we're going to be using deep neural networks, right? Uh, to um, so the agents are going to use deep neural networks, LSTMs, uh, long short term memory networks, convolutional neural networks, and so on. And here we have in this slide some, some of the pros and the cons of using uh, these neural networks uh, for, um, so we, there's a series of papers that actually show, and, 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 and we've shown that in, in, in some of the papers you can find on SSRM, right? So in fact, the models time series and classification problems, oftentimes deep learning models, not very large, uh, deep learning models, but rather small, right? Because we typically don't have, in some of the problems, we don't have such huge data, right? Um, okay, so we'll show here that the deep reinforcement learning can actually be, effect, be efficient, right? XGBoost, uh, so uh, tree ensembles, which is uh, from the family of, of supervised learning algorithms can also be something that competes with deep learning architecture. Right, and then uh, the cons are are common, and, and I want to just stress uh, that any um, obviously any mature right or any professional, uh, well written paper or research work on finance have to, has to be very careful on um, some sort of um, uh, on the claims it it, it uh, the claims right. So the idea is uh, finance is non stationary right or very close to non-stationarity so at non-stationary so the, the the regular definition of of stationarity the time series is the time series has the same mean and the same variance over time right so it's what we learn in econometrics right this is hard to have right and and again not no, we have no we have we really have no guarantee that in the future right our algorithms will operate in somehow a, a, the same environment Right, so this actually, um, it's like a robot, so to speak, right? So if, if we model the robot, looking at the historical tasks uh, that we want it to perform, right? It's one matter. The other is we, we, if we leave the robot in the wild, right? To solve other real life problems, right? Uh, that's very different. Uh, that's, uh, that's an analogy I wanted to make with finance. So finance, not the, again, uh, things could change. Um, uh, we have now an environment of rising rates. We have now an environment of inflation. We have now an environment of, uh, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and so on and so forth. These things we have never seen that in the past at the same time, right? So that's why we need to be very careful um, with our algorithms in an environment which we can, again, we cannot guarantee that. Um, also, our models need to interpret the well, There's obviously always the discussion of overfitting if, if you have uh, models that are just uh, some sort of too big, um, you might overfit. Overfitting is, um, for the ones who are not familiar, is when you have a large gap between the, tra the training set performance and the test set performance. And, and, and in finance, this is very common, right? Um, in the sense that we, we, you, you can look at 20, 50 years of market data, you can find a model that, that actually fits well and, right? And typically performance deteriorate when again, the robot finds itself in real life and then things start changing and you, and you, and you find yourself in a pandemic and then you find yourself in a war and then you find yourselves in a technology revolution and so on and so forth right always the question is also enough data right so do we have enough data right so there's problems in finance in which we have lots of data there's a problem in, like for example high frequency high frequency right or and there are problems in which we have a small data like for example these uh, these uh, asset allocation problems Okay, so let's let's move on. Okay, so the paper. So 
as I said, so right, obviously, with this short duration cannot um, of this talk, we cannot, I cannot just obviously explain the whole reinforcement learning theory, but it's a machine learning approach concerned with solving dynamic optimization problems in almost uh, almost model free way by maximizing a reward function in states and action spaces, right? So the typical way to, 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 to frame um, its uh, markup decision processes uh, and so on and so forth, right? And there's a rich theory, right? You can uh, take, you can pick the uh, Sator and Barto book, which is a, a reference. So what, what are we trying to do here, right? Is we're gonna try to, uh, or which we're, we're, we, we have put together a, a, a reinforcement learning algorithm, right? That tries to obtain the weights of the assets that maximize the reward in a given state of the market considering uh, risk and transaction cost, right? Um, okay, so the idea is we are only gonna feed the, the, the reinforcement learning algorithms with a time series of, 20, of 24 US stocks. And, the, the, and, and we're gonna build a mathematical model and we're gonna say, can this mathematical model or, or these reinforcement learning uh, algorithms be able to learn what they what what it needs to be done when, when looking at the time series of these 24 stocks in order to maximize the reward, which are returns here. Okay. Um, in order to do that, we're going to be using um, long short term memory networks, convolutional neural networks, and uh, vanilla recurrent neural networks. Okay. And we're going to be comparing the results of these agents that use these neural networks, these different architecture of neural networks with uh, the more traditional approaches like mean variance optimization, minimum variance, disparity, uh, equally weighted, and so on. This is important because, um, so why this is important? It's, it's big, but obviously one of the problems we have in finance is uh, Harry Markowitz in 1952, uh, some sort of, invented or discovered a wonderful mathematical model to solve uh, to solve portfolio optimization problems. So he said, right, that if you have a vector of expected returns and a covariance matrix, all you have to do is solve a quadratic optimization problem, right? If, um, and then we cannot, we've learned is that if, if the distributions are, if the distributions are elliptical and, um, uh, you can actually, by looking at the mean and the variance of the outcome, uh, is just enough, right? We have also learned the hard way that um, this is not working extremely well, right? Um, okay, so there's a variety of different fixes. Again, risk parity, equal weight, and black Litterman obviously are, are potential solutions in order to deal with the fact that uh, mean variance is very sensitive to um, ingredients to these uh, returns and covariance metrics. Okay, so let me move on. Okay, so um, so the idea of uh, the idea of uh, reinforcement learning is is uh, uh, um, uh, a, 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 an agent that tries to capture the most important aspects of a real problem interacting with this environment over time. And this agent tries to maximize the goal related to the state of the environment. And this is the definition from Saturn and Barto. When, when we want to define this mathematically, this is a way to solve multi-period optimal control problems, right? And the, the RL agent policy typically consists of explicitly maximizing the action value function for the current state. The value function is an approximation of the actual value function of the multi-period optimal control and, um, and the difference uh, from supervised learning is that, oh, so what is the difference, right? So there's a big, really obviously big difference because supervised learning uh, typically in portfolio management is used to predict returns or, or to make a better estimate of the covariance matrices, right? The two ingredients of modern portfolio theory, 
right? And here, what we try to do is that the agent actually decides, right, uh, on the weights, so finds the optimal weights, uh, all, all, also considering, um, also considering uh, transaction costs, right? Okay, so this is, okay. So, um, <clears throat> so the agent is acting in an environment here, the environment is gonna be defined uh, as the time series of 24 stocks. Okay, so here, uh, obviously, there's always questions, right, on as to whether this is enough, right? Obviously, we're not claiming in the paper that time series is all you need, right, to do portfolio management, right? So by no, obviously, by no means, all finance professionals know that you also need uh, potentially factables, right? And we will soon write another, we will soon release another paper in which we use factors instead of uh, this time series, right, uh, of, of, of returns. But here, uh, what we can do is, uh, or what we do in the paper, is when we compare uh, using time series, the different approaches with uh, some sort of reinforcement learning approach, right? Okay, so here, right, um, in terms of the different taxonomies, Right, that the reinforcement learning models have, right? So there's a, when we know the model, right? This is called a model-based RL, right? Or if we don't know, um, this is model-free. So our, our approach is model-free, right? We do, not, we do not assume anything, right? The, 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 what the agents are gonna do is we, they're gonna be given a reward function with, which, which is gonna be the returns, right? Um, a set of tools, which is these neural networks, right? And um, the cost, the transaction cost, and the neural network and, and the agent is gonna need to learn on how to operate, use these tools in order to maximize uh, these returns. Okay, so, okay. So here we have more definitions, right? Um, okay, I'll skip that. You can read that uh, in the paper. Um, okay, but this is some sort of a more after model to transition and reward, right? So, um, okay, so let me skip that. Okay. The policy, so, so, um, so there's, there's fundamental aspects of reinforcement learning is, is, uh, uh, the policy, which is the obviously what what's, uh, what we are interested into finding. So the, typically the notation we used is pi, and pi is a sequence of actions, right? It can be stochastic or deterministic. Then uh, the value function, the value function measures the, the re future reward of a state or, or an action, right? And the, the return of future reward is the total sum of these counted rewards. Right, and then we have the Q value uh, of a state uh, action value pair, right, and so on. Okay, so I don't, uh, we don't have time to cover this in detail, right? We obviously cover this in the bootcamp, in our uh, August bootcamp from May to the 13th, right? Um, okay, and the idea is, is to find uh, an optimal value function that achieves the return, so, um, the Bellman equations, right, are the set of equations that decompose this value function into the immediate reward and, and, and future discounted values. Okay, this is if you've done, um, and this is uh, an equation that Coleman Ritter in 2019, right, um, so state, stated to say, okay, so many problems in finance, right, option hedging, optimal execution, optimal trading of alpha core forecast can be casted in the uh, reinforcement learning, um, some sort of framework, right? Uh, so the value function, right, um, of pi of, 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 of a policy is the expectation of this integral from zero to capital T of XTRT minus lambda, uh, half X square T sigma square T. So XTRT is, the reward, so to speak, right? Uh, lambda 
Um, so the second term is obviously the risk, is the variance, right? And F uh, X dot is um, the market impact, right? F X dot is some function of the time derivative. So DX T DT approximating the market impact. So, um, okay, so the question mark is gonna be can the agent learn to do the three things, right? To some sort of optimized return, obviously considering risk, which is the second uh, term. And the third is, uh, can, can, can you consider to right, the um, transaction cost? Okay, so let me, in order to solve, uh, we have things like actor critic and so on, but here we'll, we'll use, uh, right, uh, deep learning, uh, in order to solve that. So we have the agent, which is a neural network, a tensor of features, which is the state, uh, a market, which is the environment. The idea is we want to maximize the cost adjusted returns, uh, not risk adjusted. I'm saying cost adjusted because here we're not considering risk, right? Explicitly in the reward, right? Okay, so that's, a very, that's an important aspect, right? So here we try to maximize returns but we will see that that actually the agents learn that um, that uh, it needs to consider risk by itself. Okay. Okay. The reward function is uh, here the logarithmic cumulative return. So you can find uh, the 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 actually the the details on 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 the paper. But as I said, we're not considering here risk-adjusted returns, right? But returns, right? But implicitly we consider costs in, in a way that I'll show, in, uh, I'll show in a second how we consider costs. Okay, we, we define our policy pi as a mapping from state space to action space, right? And we'll, uh, we will use gradient descent to update the parameters of the given learning rate lambda in the direction of the gradient and so on. Okay, and then we're going to be comparing, right, um, the, re the reinforcement learning agent that I'll show in a second with, uh, with the usual approaches. So a co-weighted portfolio, the Markovitz mean variance optimization, right, um, risk parity and minimum variance, right? So we could have chosen also, but I think these are the most, stan the most standard approaches, right? Um, okay, so what are the neural networks that are being used, right? So we've, we've uh, used convolutional neural networks. The training date range is uh, 1st January 2008 to the 33rd March 2017. And the testing date is 24th March uh, 2017 to the 1st June 2020, right? So we, we just uh, show results with the pandemic, so to speak, okay? This is, uh, and in the paper, you'll find the details of, of all the three models. Again, I've said recurrent neural networks, LSTMs, non short memory networks, and convolutional neural networks, right? Obviously, we don't have time to define them, right? But, uh, but these are neural networks that, that you can actually learn. Uh, we, you can actually learn to implement using Keras or PyTorch, so it's not. So the idea we have the HLC for 25 stocks for 50 time periods, uh, right? We have a portfolio vector memory of size 25 of one. So this is um, okay. And the and and the way we're gonna find the weights, right? Is uh, we're gonna have a final layer, right? For these neural networks, which is uh, um, a softmax layer, right? So this a softmax layer is uh, actually is a layer that actually figures out the weights, right? So it computes, uh, it it computes, um, it it adapts to one, right? And it cannot be negative, right? And softmax is used for um, classification problems and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, yeah, let's look at the results, right? Obviously, again, there's a lot of technical details. You'll find them uh, in the paper, right? Uh, but how, what can we say, right? 
Um, okay, about the traditional approaches, right? Let's say, right, um, uh, we have equal weight portfolio, right? And it's uh, sharp ratios of 52. Uh, mean variance optimization of 51, risk parity of 49, minimum variance of, of um, 59, right? And then uh, the different approaches using neural networks of so 52, right? Um, one uh, of 53 or 63, right? So the, the, most perform, the best performing model would be a reinforcement learning agent that uses LSTMs Right, that has um, some sort of right uh, a max throwdown uh, of 29, and and okay, and it also has somehow a little bit of a lower turnover, right, that um, than the traditional models. Um, okay. Um, here you have the results, right? Uh, again, um, so so you see that the, the C, a CNN with no weight control delivers uh, just just this very good results. So let me come back. Okay, when when I say weight control, we mean that if we introduce transaction costs, all of a sudden the neural networks pay a lot of attention to the costs, right? So again, right, the the fact that uh, the fact that we you can introduce transaction costs, right, uh, is actually useful because then the neural net was not only paying attention to the re, to the to the forecast of the return, so to speak, but also uh, paying attention to uh, to the costs, right, uh, of all these. Um, okay, so. Um, what are the things that we'd like to, 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 to mention? So obviously you will see here, right? That obviously neural networks, right? Or so all the approaches suffered, right? In uh, the pandemic era, so to speak. And obviously the, the reinforcement learning agents right here also, right? Or uh, have had this throwdown, this uh, January, uh, February uh, to, well, March, uh, 2020. Right, they, they, they had um, all these uh, drawdowns, right? And, and this is just an example, right, of, uh, is this something we can expect? Uh, uh, and the answer is absolutely yes, in the sense that neural networks or the agents, if they haven't seen any uh, a similar environment, chances are that they will also uh, will struggle in an in an environment in, in which returns some sort of a highly volatile or much more volatile than that 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 the that the agents have ever seen uh, and so on and so forth. Um, okay, but and and that's something that uh, that um, I would say all finance professionals should be aware when they use models, right? Um, in the sense that, right, when we are using, right, historical data, like we do here, right, the neural networks, the, the mean variance approach, the equal weight, whatever, well, well, equal weight, obviously, it's, it doesn't, it, it's, you don't need to learn anything. It's just the same way every, every day. But let's say uh, other models that require estimation, like mean variance, for example, that requires the estimates, the estimates of returns and, and covariance matrices, right? Um, will will obviously uh, struggle when there's a change uh, of regime and and when there's an unexpected thing happen, right? So, um, but here, right, we expect that uh, the agents actually are able to learn to do a little bit of risk management. Right, so this is something that that they can also uh, do. Okay, so let me come back. Give me a second, I'm trying to scroll. Okay, yeah. So, um, so yeah. So, so may, the conclusion uh, is that with with work in a in a in a in a in a experiment in which 
the agents, reinforcement learning agents, learn how to operate, right? Um, with this, with the framework we created, we, they only optimize returns, but cost-adjusted returns in the sense of, of transaction costs. And the agents seem to also learn um, to manage risk in the sense that they're they're right uh, they're efficiently uh, so to speak um, um, manage right uh, risk okay but uh, you'll see in the paper we're not claiming that you have to throw away right the old models and use reinforcement learning agents why I'm saying that is just because um, and I'm uh, and I'll, I'm going to conclude right with this. So the typical traditional model, right, the portfolio managers have is that somebody takes care of the returns. So typically the portfolio managers need to, right, do provide uh, uh, an estimate of the returns for next period, right, for next week, for example, right? Okay. Risk managers need to figure out a covariance matrix of next week too. So what is the covariance matrix, right? Okay, then the portfolio construction says, well, we're going to use mean variance, right? We're going to obviously use constraints, right? Uh, because this, here, there's something that I haven't mentioned, but you'll see in the paper that the agents do not specifically learn about diversification. The agents, if they don't see, if, they, if, you, if the agents don't see in the data set, that they need to be more conservative and not to put all X in one basket because of the item security risk and so on and so forth, right? So this is something that it has to be baked in the model, so to speak, the sense that, uh, okay? So diversification as uh, it's not baked in, in uh, so the, the agents do not seem to learn the concept by themselves, the concept of diversification. Um, which we know it's good, right? And we use it as heuristics to improve our portfolios, right? And then we get more robust portfolios, okay? So this is one important aspect, right? And, um, and then the third step, right, of portfolio management is somebody is taking it, is, 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 is uh, considering transaction costs, right? When, and you, when you're very big, when you're UBS or Fidelity and so on, you have very large portfolios, obviously there's a lot of market impact and you need to figure out how you're gonna optimize, right? Um, so that's one of the benefits of using an A to Z model, what we call A to Z, which is you do everything, right? But you lose transparency, right? At the same time, so you don't know where you were wrong so to speak right so that's what i'm saying that that and i was told uh, and i was telling keith right that um that there's a big debate as to whether should we use these models that learn from the data to to perform a uh, portfolio allocation should we let the models and the the agents right operate right and uh, and there's a big question mark here right um, on, on terms of transparency, right? And also there's a big question mark on something really crucial, which is the reliance and the over-reliance of some of the models we might be using on historical data, right? Um, so we, what we've learned after, you know, several decades in finance is that risk management, right? It cannot only be done using historical data. Unfortunately, uh, historical data doesn't contain enough edge cases, right, uh, for us to manage portfolios, right, or uh, to do uh, some sort of, uh, or to have some sort of robustness. Um, and and I want to make an, an analogy to to which is obviously very different, uh, a very different modeling problem, which is uh, which is. Um, obviously um, autonomous cars but but the idea is if you want to be say if you want to make your machine learning or AI algorithms more robust and also your finance algorithms obviously right considering scenarios plausible scenarios edge cases is is absolutely crucial 
right, on the development of your models. So that's why this mesh, the, the, the thing that I mentioned that unsupervised learning, it's more important that you think when you first see it, right? When you first see it is why would I be so interested in modeling P of X, right? I have X's, I have Y's, I have returns and I have, right? Uh, and the question and the answer is, if you're able to model, um, if you're able to model the multivariate distribution of the market um, a little bit better, right? By using, for example, generative adversarial networks, and then being able to use that um, to, to amplify, uh, augment the data, your models are gonna be a little bit better, right? Um, so that's why, again, um, and supervised learning, it's also extremely important in the, fu in the future of finance. Right. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> yeah. So that's that was. Um... Yeah. So, so thank you, Miguel. We we appreciate the, those remarks and the and the work you've put into the paper. Uh, it, it it strikes me that that the models have a difficult time in these in these turning points. Right. That markets are inherently non-stationary. We've seen a lot of things the last couple of years on on COVID and so on. And now that you brought uh, self-driving cars into this right now, there's an investigation that, you know, what, what they're not used to seeing creates problems with them. Right. There's there's a lot of collisions with uh, with uh, emergency vehicles that, that maybe don't don't uh, 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 comply with the regular rules of the road. So is there a way you could predict these turning points? Can you use uh, markup models or, or something else to, to try to figure out when the models can be more effective or, or less effective and, and maybe, maybe Well, I think are these turning think, points? Yeah, way, well, obviously this is different context, right? But in order to, to answer the autonomous cars question, obviously, right, um, the problem with Autonomous cars is that, uh, uh, let's imagine that I think there's around 75,000 uh, car deaths uh, in, in the United States every year, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, so it's a large number, right? Um, obviously, autonomous cars should, should be operating with just a tiny fraction of this because the way users evaluate autonomous cars is that if they see bizarre things, even if there's 50 deaths in the United States caused by these cars, people's gonna be terrified, right? You see what I mean, right? So the standard for autonomous car is really that they have to try to achieve almost zero deaths, right? <laughs> so it's, they have to, re how can you do that? And it's obviously, Right, it's a combination of your neural networks uh, being able to have seen as many edge cases as possible, right? Uh, you, and because again, you run a trillion miles and you still haven't seen all the edge cases by any means, because literally anything could happen in a road, right? There's a girl crossing the bicycle with a yellow dress that might be confusing the algorithms, right? Maybe there's two bicycles, maybe there's three bicycles. You see what I mean, right? So, um, so yeah, the, 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 the work that Waymo and Tesla have, it's, it's a very hard one, which is they have, to, they have to try to get almost zero deaths. And, and that means that inventing data or augmenting data is very important for them. Because again, even if you run if, even if you're able to record all the automobile activity in the United States for a year, I'm sure you will not see enough edge cases to drive, safe, drive safely, right? All the cars in the United States, right? You see with all the change in the lanes and, and, and so it's a very hard problem, right? Uh, when, when it comes to finance, obviously in finance, nobody, nobody expects a portfolio to have zero losses, right? This would be, right? Um, I mean, we all know that it would be just not, not plausible to think about zero risk and, and delivering returns. So nobody has ever done that. 
And that cannot be done probably because of what you said about stationarity. So things happen and knowns come, right? And so on. The promise here that machine learning can bring is that, that we might be able to produce more data with, uh, with, um, with uh, generative models. Um, also, uh, what, what reinforcement learning agents can do that it's not baked in other models is that maybe they provide you with a better risk management strategy. You see what I mean? What do I have to do when things turn sour, right? How do I do? I reduce the portfolio drastically to zero, the weights to zero, I hedge, uh, and so on and so forth, right? So it's going to be interesting to see how these agents are able to learn with management strategies, right? Uh, so when things are not going according to plan, right? Um, so, um, and, and I think this is not algorithms, if you see what I mean. This is about the data. Okay, so the problem of Tesla and Waymo is not that the neural networks are not able to do incredible stuff, is that you don't know if the neural networks have seen enough stuff to be able to, do, to deal with anything that could happen in a row. You see what I mean? Which is a very hard problem, right? But, uh, but Waymo and Tesla, for example, what they do is, is they try to invent new situations, right? Um, because again, recording what's happening is not enough, right? Um, they need to see the, the, the neural networks need to see even more things, right? And and how can you produce simulations so you you have a vector you have a vector space, right? The vector space is you actually translate whatever is happening in the road to vectors, right? Because neural networks deal with vectors; they do not deal with cars and and girls or boys or whatever. Right, they deal with um, vectors. So you can actually try to some sort of produce plausible new scenarios in which things happen, right? All of a sudden, there's a truck that stopped just in the middle of the road when a girl was, uh, things like that, right? Uh, but yeah, so there's a lot of things that, that um, and I think once data scientists, um, need to be, I think, need to be more clever than we were in the past, in the sense that in the past we thought, well, every, we have lots of data, right? We've seen everything that, that, that we had to see, right? And we quickly learned that, that you know, that the reality is really very uh, imaginative and many things happen. Now you, you you brought up a large investor like uh, like Fidelity. So how feasible is this technology for them? Uh, I saw something on twenty to twenty five percent daily turnover. Can you can you run the models in, in a slower way? And then how concentrated are these are these portfolios? Uh, yeah. How do you how do you constrain the weights? Is there a minimum number of stocks and so on? Yeah. So we 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 first of all right one way to reduce turnover it's easy right which is you, you switch on the transaction costs all of a sudden, right? Then uh, neural networks learn, right? That they do not have to trade, uh, you know, crazily, right? As they do if they're not transaction costs, right? So when we, you switch on a transaction costs, then the agents uh, learn how to, right? Uh, you see what I mean, right? So that's one thing. The other thing is that uh, we're thinking about introducing constraints in the soft mass layer, right? And I don't know in the audience this, 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 uh, and that's not an easy problem, right? That's not an easy problem because um, when we do quadratic optimization, right, a la, a la Markowitz, right? We know that we have good technologies to introduce constraints and still be able to solve it very efficiently, right? So I don't want the stocks to be more than 5%, right? Or 3% and so on. This is very easy. Still, it's quadratic optimization. You can solve that very fast. So this ain't a problem, right? But for neural networks, this, this is not as easy, right? To some sort of introduce constraints in the outputs, right? Um, but we're working in a paper 
in which uh, we hope to be able to regularize right uh, the weights okay regularization is a, is a way of introducing soft constraints right so you penalize large weights you don't necessarily you, you don't necessarily it's a bake hard bake them to say okay no more than five percent right but their technologies and you can use uh, regularization right which is uh, a constraint on the large weights which is something that has proven to be efficient for example when you do factor models right so when you do factor models also large betas are a real problem right you can make the analogy large betas are never good right o on a portfolio or on a factor right you you don't feel comfortable right having very large betas because probably are require leverage we all know that leverage is not something we like in the portfolios <laughs> it's it's actually our, our crypto brothers are actually learning that the hard way <laughs> we see this the weights of three percent for the crypto brothers right <laughs> yeah the crypto brothers are seeing the hard way what we told them right that uh, leverage it's never been good right maybe in the new instruments might be but um anyway so um but but yeah you would say that you you'll be happy to introduce that in in real life if uh, if uh, if actually agents are interpretable interpretable and actually agents produce these nice diversified portfolios right which is going to i think it's not very far away from from the possibilities. Hmm? So, 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 Miguel, th th this paper is uh, pr pretty complex, and you're you're writing as a, as an academic, uh, trying to advance the the boundaries of the of the literature. But if somebody's uh, uh, new to, to machine learning, uh, you know, where where would they start? You know, certainly there's there's FDP and you know registrations open for the October exam. But uh, we're, we're requiring a, a, a book for the, the October exam, uh, Machine Learning and Business by John Hall. Uh, that, that book seems to be uh, written at a relatively introductory level. Is, is there there's some uh, specific uh, reading that, that you'd recommend for, for somebody to, uh, to get up to speed on the, on the machine learning curriculum? Yeah, obviously, as I said, we, we offer the bootcamp in August from 8 to the 13th, New York. Right there, we there we we some sort of uh, train on on machine learning algorithms applied to finance. But I would say if I have to choose three books, right, one is this machine learning in finance from theory to practice by Matthew Dixon, uh, Paul Bilokon, uh, and um, I, Igor Halperin. Um, then obviously the the Marcos Lopez de Prado books. On, on machine learning and 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 third it, there's a nice very nice book about factor modeling and machine learning by tony guida and guillaume coqueret which is actually open is actually you can find it for free um in the internet is that it's called ml factor which is a really nice a really good book right the three books or or the two books right actually have the code and the data sets so that's a very good way to learn right so as as, as, as you, one of the main uh, i think one of the main revolutions in finance is the fact that books now as our ai brothers or my ml brothers right everything is all is tend to go um open source and this is a good it, this is very good for us right because it means that you have notebooks out there that you can try you can modify them a little bit it can they can be used uh, and so on right so so the, the the from the from from the theory to implementation it's not like it was five to ten years ago it was very hard to 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 implement these very technical papers right because now you have a, a bunch of code out there and and you can actually try very complex models in your in your laptop it's obviously different if you want to do nlp we also do quite a lot of natural language processing language problems are much uh, are much larger but uh, in terms of uh, computation um but you have access to the models too right so i think this is so it's easier 
I would say it's easier than ever to actually from from education to implementation i think it's it's um um it's just you you're you probably weeks away right or months away i'm not saying and before that you know implementing a paper was a nightmare because you actually had to write the code test the code get the data set and so on and so forth and and maybe maybe the data is more more difficult now because there's like no code low code solution something like a like a data robot. So you uh, you you have the, the comparison table. You looked at equal weighted and mean variance optimization and risk parity. Did you do anything in the in the Fama French Carhartt space? Did you compare your results to uh, a, a ah. size or a value or a momentum strategy? No, this is a purely time series problem, right? So and and. And, and it's good because you can compare, right? So, because you can pick a mean variance, time series, kind of, kind of estimation of returns and, and covariances. We're writing a paper now in which we're gonna, I think it's gonna be out in a couple of, in a couple of weeks. And we're gonna do that, but using factors, using 200 factors, okay? And then you can use these 200 factors to predict returns. Right of a large number of stocks, right, and see also if reinforcement learning agents are able uh, to use them. Right, um, I would say that factor models are are a different problem than time series. We all know. So time series, is you have to to to, to somehow um, deal with non-stationarity. Right, factor models too. Right, because things change, but. In fact, almost you also have other issues on the table, which is obviously uh, you have to select the factors. So factor selection is something you have to deal with, right? It's a, and, and it's pretty hard, right? And with 200 uh, factors, that's a big problem. Of course, but then, but then you have these regularizing models, right? And you know that then the, the nets or the trees, an XGBoost model is going to is going to some sort of use a much much more reduced uh, number of of factors. Uh, it's like, so, thanks so, so much some of the go. models, it's 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 a little bit of equivalent to to to. Um, so so why ML is being so? I wouldn't obviously. I'm not saying here that ML is just the, the, the crystal ball. You use it. There's no accidents. Your portfolio is zero risk and, and all returns. Not, not, I'm not saying that, that by any means. But what I'm saying is that machine learning models are the tools that scientists, machine learners are using for highly dimensional systems, right, uh, in which it's really hard to write an equation saying, right? It's, it's really hard to write a, a, a parametric model saying, I'm gonna use these five factors. These five factors are gonna have that relationship. So econometricians have, uh, and quants have tried this for obviously decades, right? Chances are, is that a machine, right? Finds the best combination, right? Um, but with all the caveats, right? Again, if things change, if there's new factors emerge that were in there. Yeah, right. and it's got to work out a sample. <laughs> right. Thank That's you correct. both. I want to just interrupt quickly. I do want to be uh, respectful of our attendees' time. And uh, it's so nice to have one of our distinguished advisory board members here today for the FDP Institute to share his insight and wisdom about the re deep reinforcement learning. And Keith, for your excellent moderation. As we wrap up today, um, just a few updates again about the FDP Institute that we have association partnerships with AMA, CASA, JADA, and FIA Montreal. So to check out our website to see if you're eligible for any discounts pertaining to our association partnerships. Our next exam will be starting October 17th of 2022, and our early registration period will be closing on July 20th. So we do offer our test center exams as well as remote proctoring. And we hope that you'll visit our webinar library for a recording of today's really insightful um, presentation as well as joining us next Wednesday for more information about the ProProctor testing. So again, I wanna thank you both. And Keith, if you just wanna close us out, we'd be most appreciative. And thank you again, Miguel.
Uh, thanks, everyone. And uh, we, we appreciate your attendance today. If you could go back just one slide, Kim. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about our, uh, our next webinar. It's I on uh, pre predicting <laughs> crypto prices uh, using uh, AI and machine learning. So that, that'll be uh, uh, in, in July. So, so tune in for that one uh, using uh, uh, quite a volatile data set. So July 14th, uh, we, we have the opportunity to sit down with, with Alan Waldman. And so uh, we welcome you back for that. Uh, thanks, everyone. Have a, have a great day.